Amen. Sister Jackie, could you explain to us what the rule of first mention is? Could you explain to us what the rule of first mention is? A little bit louder. A little bit more. You're in the passage, you see a word, you want to understand what that word means and how it should be used, what, the, what, the, what it symbolizes. So you go to its first mention, so you said that, that's all correct, then what? So you're at the first mention of it. So you see how that word is used in its very first mention and that usage there, then what? Would I understand the way it is used? The context, trust the way the that passage is maybe you want to understand that like yesterday we were looking for the one hand. Don't give me an example. Don't want an example, I want a definition. Examples are easier, the definition is much harder to, to get. So I want to know if we can understand the definition, the examples all fit in. Then you can look for when you want to understand a word in a passage which you are reading, you could look where it is first mentioned. You, you've told us all of that. We're at that we're at that first mention, we've looked at its context, then what do we do? You could understand, then you do an application of the passage which you are using. Okay. What technique are we employing when we do that, Sister Joy? Um, Louder. The the beginning the beginning of the end the later. Because we are now taking the meaning surrounding that word where it is first mentioned and applying it to the end of the world. Okay, so that's the little bit that was missing. We're going to use Alpha and Omega where it was first seen and then where it was uh, where we're making an application at the end of the world. So this is Alpha and Omega. What is that methodology or that system of learning? What's the word that we most often use that everybody is familiar with? If we were going to do that, my brother, what would we call it? Rule of first mention. You've understood, Sister Jackie's explained that. Did that make sense? I'm just asking you, did it make sense? Yeah, but I, I want to add something. I'm not asking you to add anything yet. Just did that make sense, what she said? Then Sister Joy said, Alpha and Omega, the beginning typifies the end. Or, yep, the beginning typifies the end. And I want, I want another way of explaining that methodology, one that everybody knows. Okay. Uh, to me, it is the, 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 
it is finding the characteristics of something that I'm going to stop you there it's a really simple answer Sister Emma no sorry that's what we've already been told so the reason I'm asking you is because you insisted yesterday that this doesn't work because it's literal. So you tell me what methodology we're using. What is that called? They're whispering. Sorry? <laughs> one word will do. You can, you can do it in one word. You can do a phrase, I don't mind. Brother Benjamin? Parable. Parable teaching. You go to the natural to explain the spiritual. So when you insist that this is a literal hand, that is not evidence against what we're teaching, that is evidence to show what we're teaching is a sound biblical principle. Are we okay with that? It's a simple parable teaching. You wanted to add a bit. You know, I was happy for you to add, I just wanted to get that out of the way before you said anything. So, I can add now? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying, you can add now, say what you wanted to say now. So, what I'm saying is, looking at the characteristics of certain documents in the Bible, then you apply that to the characteristics of the Bible. Okay, so we spent a lot of time doing that. Then we clarified another issue, which was related to that, but it's really separate and distinct that, and we haven't done that in this class and the reason I haven't done that is because the way these classes have uh, lent themselves we haven't gone to the Greek and Hebrew and the reason we haven't gone to the Greek and Hebrew is because we've spent a lot of time at this school focusing on the spirit of prophecy and Greek and Hebrew won't help you in the spirit of prophecy we haven't actually gone to that many Bible passages um, and broken them down and needed the help of the Greek and Hebrew to do that so that's why we haven't I haven't mentioned or spoken about it but it came up yesterday that what we're going to do is we're going to look at the word hand go to its first mention which is where brother Andrew Genesis 3.22 and when you see the hand then when we started interrogating that we went down the wrong road. And what was the wrong road that we went down, my brother? In defining the word hand. A bit more. It was in it was in the way we defined the word hand, yes. But what would we be doing wrong? By checking from the word. From in the Hebrew word. So we went to the Hebrew to check what the word hand meant, and that is not the way you use the rule of first mention or parable. Because if you go to the Hebrew, you have three, four, or sometimes more, sometimes less, but you have more than one definition. So you can't use that technique. To find out first usage or first mention you have to see the definition of the word in its context in the English that's what we were doing and when we did that in that situation with the word hand what did we see it was nothing to do with literal it was nothing to do with men what was it to do with it was to do with power so we had an act, a decision, a power or strength. So if you take all of that, it's someone makes a decision, acts upon it because they have power and strength. 
Then, once you know what its definition is, you could go into the Hebrew if you wanted to, but you don't need to. But we did because we had been directed there. And when you see that, the primary definition of hand in the Hebrew is what? My hey, brother? Primary definition. It's, um, it's something prior or near. Sorry? It's something remote or uh, either is near. No. That was in the definition, but that was not the primary thought of what that of what that word hand, thirty twenty seven, I think, was trying to portray. Can't remember. Brother Wilson? <coughs> Compared to what? It says this means power and strength, but this does not. My brother? Okay, an open hand is strength and a closed hand is not strength. It says, as compared to that other Hebrew word, I can't remember the number. And if you looked at that, it was either the sole of the foot or the palm of the hand. Essentially, it was something that was closed. When it's closed, you have no power because it's your fingers that give your hand power to grasp hold of something and do or put into action the decision that you're making. So it's quite explicit. So then you go to secondary and tertiary definitions of what hand means, and it can mean proximity, near, or separation and far, which is where you get division and part. So it was, a, it was a, just a small exercise in trying to understand when we look at Greek and Hebrew words, when they give all these definitions, you have to be careful how you use them. And too often, because we're not well versed in how to, not in the Greek and Hebrew languages, because you don't need to be, but how to use those lexicons, sometimes we can make, I suggest, wrong applications or wrong usage of those tools. So when we do that, we need to be careful how we're approaching um, those lexicons and they stop becoming a help and they end up becoming a hindrance because we're using them in an inappropriate or wrong way. So we need to be careful about that. So we spent a lot of time doing that because the class wise, because I think it was a, well, a worthwhile exercise. <coughs> Why did we even go there? We went there because we want to understand the increase of knowledge in the Millerite history. And if you want to go one step back, we wanted to understand <coughs> how and why they were brought to a point of decision when the Lord concealed the mistake that the Millerites had made. And we spent most of yesterday trying to understand how and why that mistake was made. Then we went to the hand. We saw the hand is a symbol of power. If you go back and bring that concept into that passage, what does it mean when the Lord hid, uh, put his hand and hid a mistake? And then when he removed his hand, the mistake was seen. In the context of power, what does that mean? Explain that, my brother. When I say brother, you've got to look at me because everybody, because I can't remember everyone's name. Explain that. So, according to what I have told is putting forth his heart means they are feeding me. I'm not asking you to explain Genesis 3.22, now I'm asking you to explain early writings to something, 
2325. What page was that? I was saying 74, but that we went, we actually read another one. 236. 236. We didn't actually read the, the 74. 236 point. This is the one that Sister Emma wanted us to go to. Okay? I'm talking about that one, where it says that Lord um, lifted up his hand. I'll read it so that we can refresh ourselves. The hand of the Lord was removed from the figures and the mistake was explained. So, the Lord had his hand over the figures and they removed it and then the mistake was explained. Explain what that means. Oh, the right one. <laughs> Brother Kuto gave us the rules to use. He said, go to use the rule of first mention, Genesis 3.22. We did what he said. We found out that it meant power. So we're going to use that one. Makes no sense. Hey, brother. I've said that it is point one. Yeah, thank you. I've said that that the power of the Lord was holding that mistake that you The power of the Lord was doing what? Was holding that mistake. Holding the mistake. Yeah, that could be seen. What does it mean to hold the mistake? Okay. It's the same word as to cover. Yeah, cover the mistake. Or not, not to be known by human beings. Okay, so start again. Think the power of the Lord was holding the mistake not to be not to be understood or not to be seen. Okay, try and use a different word than holding. I don't know what that means. Because it sounds like to me like he's holding the mistake. And I don't think you mean that. Yeah. Okay, like the ability of the people to understand the mistake was was restrained. <coughs> was restrained yeah. by by the power of the Lord. And then so they, they could not see where they were being mistaken. And then so they were disappointed. No, it just says the hand of the Lord was removed. And then and now they discovered the mistake they did. How? By again going to the scriptures that... Yeah. I thought we were talking about hands. Yes, and you were telling us that we should... I'm not telling you anything. What was your question? <laughs> Explain this sentence. In context of the power. That's what you said. Yeah. yeah that's but then you said, oh, I told you something. I didn't tell you. I don't do tell people stuff in class. It's very rare. Yeah, and that's what I'm doing. I'm using in the context of the power. Yeah, now, so. To make hand to be the power. So, so, what I want you to do is explain that passage. You seem to have really given me half of it. The hand of the Lord was removed from the figures and the mistake was explained. That's what I'm saying that the ability of the people to understand was to understand this, this mistake that they were doing now was, was first restrained and when this restraint now was removed they were able now to understand the scriptures or the prophetic people. How were they able to understand it? By again going critically and examining what they are doing. Why couldn't they go critically and examine before? 
because it was restrained from them. They can still critically go and go and go and understand. Even if you do it as man and God has said you should not understand it, you will not. So explain the la the last bit. So he did what with his what did he do? He restrained them. Yes. And then what does he do? Afterwards. Afterwards? Yeah, he removed that restraint. Okay, so he removes the restraint, and then what happens when he re removes the restraint? Now people were able to understand. How were they able to understand? By going to do it again. No, how were they able to understand? Kita? By the increase of knowledge. Which is what? In the context of the sentence, What is the increase of knowledge in the contextually? Increase of knowledge, I want to say, increase of knowledge equals what? What is the equal? Don't whisper to him. <laughs> Don't whisper to him. <laughs> okay, uh, increase of knowledge is equal to removing of the hand. The increase of knowledge is equal to the removing of the hand. Or, the increase of knowledge equals the Hand equals what? Hand equals power. So increase of knowledge equals power. Equals <coughs> equals the hand. So the passage is backwards. So the reason they're able to now <coughs> see, understand what the scriptures say is because God gives them what? God gives them power. So God is controlling what they can and cannot do. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> when we are taught the spiritual prophecy, we find our word, we go to the Bible, we find its first mention, then we find the meaning. Is that what we should do? Sometimes. I was going to mention that, that we looked at the word hand, then Brother Kuto went to the first mention. In this particular case, it was simple and it worked. It may not always be that simple. Often you don't need to go to the scriptures. Often you can see contextually what that subject is. But we went with it using this example of the hand because the hand is a relatively easy one to be able to decide, uh, decipher or decode from the scriptures because it's used in, in, in a really well-defined and tight way in the Bible so it was easy to do that with other words you could try I'm not saying it, it's not correct but it may be difficult or it may not work you have to you have to use all the different rules that we've got and try to apply them in a different problem area that we have to see which one is going to help and which one isn't sometimes it's our ignorance that we can't do it sometimes it's just not going to work that way i don't know i don't think we can use those rules and say it's always going to be 100% successful if we do that Sometimes it may be a fault on our part, sometimes it's just not going to work. But can I say that also, you can go to another passage where Ellen White has explained, where he will not use the same, same word, but he will make it simpler by explaining it. So it's not a must that we go to the first mention. We can also look in another passage how he has addressed the issue. Yes, so a simple passage explains the complex passage. We, we, we need to be well-rounded in the use of these rules and techniques. It's, it's not just one way of doing things. Okay, so um, just want someone else to go through that sentence. The hand of the Lord was removed from the figures and the mistake was explained. So, someone else do that for us. My brother? 236. 236, paragraph 1. I read the sentence. The hand of the Lord was removed from the figures and the mistake was explained.
Just the same what that my brother did. Everything that's been said was correct. Just what someone else to restate it in their own words. I'm not trying to suggest anything was said or done wrong. I just want to see, hear it in a, with someone else's voice. So I think we have correctly identified the hand. You just tell us how it works. So the hand is a, it's a symbol of an increase in knowledge. Because the hand means power of strength. So God is going to remove his hand. And when he does that, we have this increase of knowledge on the, on the prophetic period because the mistakes have been made. That works, you, Sister Emma? Sorry? She didn't hear the, either hear or didn't understand. <coughs> we have defined the hand of the Lord as, as power and strength, and we have gone to define that as an increase of knowledge. And how it applies here is that God is going to give us a new, give these people an increase of knowledge in the, the prophet, in the prophet, in the mistake. So it needs more? Okay, so you have a go. Um, God's hand had a mistake that they made, and they knew it didn't give them any peace and money. Is that it? So I. I was thinking about the latter rain and the former rain in that history. As we have shown, there is an increase of knowledge from 1798. And finding the hand to be the power of strength. And I'm thinking about the Holy Spirit in the form of the former the latter rain. So I'm saying in that first part of history up to 1844, where we see the hand removed, is where the latter rain begins to come. And these are the part of the increase of knowledge which increases and becomes stagnant the former land. So now you want to use an agricultural model to defend what's on the board? In the context of hand and in power. Yeah. But you've switched to an agricultural model and now you're saying the latter rain begins to fall on April the 19th. And the hand is removed. So the latter rain begins to fall at the arrival of the second angel. Yeah. And where's the preparation time period? And the sowing. So I combined them in that history. <laughs> okay. So you know I wasn't gonna let you get you away let you get away with that, just sort of <laughs> approximating it. I think we have to be careful if we, how, how we're going to apply, if we're going to use um, another model as a template to defend what we're saying, to do it accurately. Um, what I want us to see is that often it's when you put your hand forth to do something, which would be the symbol of power, wouldn't it? Yeah? So 322, he's going to put forth his hand to touch the fruit. That is a symbol of power. And But in this sentence, what is it? What is a symbol of power? When he removes his hand. So he's removing his hand and we're saying that means what? It means the removing of his hand means he's going to give them power to understand. And the power to understand or the ability to understand, we're calling increase of knowledge. Are we okay with that? The sentence is backward. And when the sentence is backward, what it's teaching us is that the Lord's power is being used in two different ways. There's a restraint of his power and then there's a release of his power. Can we see that? 
Yeah? Not so easy to see unless you maybe spend some time thinking about it, because it may not be exactly what we think. Okay, so let's just finish this section off. And what, 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 how we're going to do that is we're just going to give a brief overview of the historical fulfillment of what's going on here about the hand covering the mistake, what produces the mistake, how it works, and how it gets all corrected. Did we understand? So what I'm saying is what this board work here, this picture work. Are you with us, Brother Rogers? Go ahead. The historical fulfillment. So don't explain the passage now. Just run us through what we said happened and why it happened. We say when you go to that history from 1798 to 1818, there's an increase of knowledge. You find in 1818, we let me come up with a conclusion. And in this conclusion, yes, what's like about before, about before and on. So then we ask ourselves, what might have led him to come up with such terms? We said because he's going to have a beginning date for the premier time prophet that is dealing with that history, which is 300 days, and we say that the earliest date he had in that prophecy was 457, 458, and 459. So then. He's going to take the earliest, but approximate also to cater for the 450 and 459. So he has his about. So we read from from Swan, he told us after he has come up with this conclusion, he's going to take four more years to confirm it. So basically, William gave an argument that in that history, no increase of knowledge. He confirms it by 1818, still has, he has his about and all that. After he confirms it, then I think that was they are going to proclaim until they come to April 19. When they come to April 19, they come to a disappointment. And God brings them to that disappointment to bring them to a point of decision. So that disappointment, though negative to them, acted as a factor through which they, God opened up to them an increase of knowledge <coughs> on the prophetic periods on which they had made a mistake. Okay, sorry. Before we get to April 19th, I think we spoke something about this chart, the 1843. Initially, it wasn't firm to say it's 1843, but it was about on or before. But we say that Miller has come and his associate come and force him to be exact that it is 1843. And we say the reason for, for that is that now they have what we call a triangle. 508 is being what takes the pressure, then we have 47 and 677. So we say that the reason why they want to pick 548 as the anchor point is because 548 has three dates associated with it, which is 13th at 5, 12th, 19th, 12, 16th. And we say since the, it's in the modern era, they can calculate and come to exact 1843. So they go for 1843. When you come to 44, they have gone through that disappointment. Like William Miller tells them, like I told you not to be exact. So we say they are brought to a point of decision or test, and we identify that William Miller fails the test at that point. God is going to give an increase of knowledge through Snow, who clarifies the mistake they had made in the prophetic periods from the spring now to the atom of it. So the point of decision that they're going to come to here is what? What do they need to decide? My brother? Which one? This one or this one? Second one? Second one hasn't started yet. Second one hasn't started. In April, they don't even know if there's going to be any increase of knowledge. The first one. Okay, the first one then. <laughs> so, Brother Andrew, what's the decision that they have to make here?
okay? Brother Kephas, what decision did they have to make in April? They have to come to a point of decision. The light that has come out of the Which light? The light that has come out of the world of God was removing the hand. Let's No, not not the removing of the hand. I mean the light that comes as a result. This light? Yes. No, I think you're going to end up saying the same thing as my brother at the back if you do that. The one day one year principle. Sorry? The one day one year principle. The okay, so here they have to come to a point of decision. So we've got day for a year, but it, I, I, want to express, I want us to express it not using day for a year. I want, to, I want to, us to express it in a different way, in a concept. Here they, they have to make a decision. Sorry? They have to try as well, I'm not sure if they answer it correctly. But they have to make a decision whether they are using the methodology. Which methodology? Whose methodology? Okay. They have to make a decision for organized time. For what? For organized time. In April there. What time? Four or against time. Four or against time, okay. Yeah. What time? Would you, would you mean four or against time? Uh, accepting or against You know, decision. You make decision. You accept it or not. When you say time, would you mean time? Yeah, uh, it is uh, a day for a year, present. Okay, I, I understand. So, in April, they, point, they brought to a point of decision. Has God led them all of this way? Has there been an increase of knowledge? Have they been reading the scriptures correctly? And all of that is summarized by saying, they go to Daniel chapter 8, and... Lots of people know the 2300 year prophecy. It's not new. People have known about it for a long time. So they have to come to a point of decision. Have they interpreted that passage correctly? Are they supposed to take 457, calculate some um, time span of 2300 years using day for a year principle and come to a date? They know that there's been a mistake here, but they have to decide, is William Miller and all of his message true or false? Because what is his message? We can say it in a number of different ways. The highest way we would say is what? what is, who is William Miller? What is his job function? First angel. So that's the primary thing. Is the judgment hour cry of the first angel, is that correct or not? Or has all of this been a lie for the last 46 years? Depending on how you're going to calculate that. You could go for 25, which is when he first began to push forward his ideas. We could say it's 10 years if we're going to start when he starts preaching in 33 or starts getting his, he got his license, he was preaching a little bit before. So the question is, the point of decision, is this movement being led by God or not? Are the principles, the rules, the methodology that they've used to develop all of this correct or not? That's the point of decision. And it's all based upon the fact they said <coughs> the judgment has come, Christ is about to return, and he hasn't. So they all know there's a mistake that's been made. Everybody knows that. But the point of decision that they have to decide is just because they made a mistake, is everything that they've been teaching totally wrong and the Catholics are correct, we'll use it in that framework, or are the Millerites correct 
but they just made a small mistake somewhere and we need to find out what the mistake is. That's the point of decision. And it's all based upon what? The rules and methodology that William Miller has developed, his creed, his 14 rules, is all of that rubbish or is those the, are those the principles that we're supposed to be using to be able to understand how to interpret scripture? Is the end of the world really here or not? Everything that he's been teaching us, the information on the chart, is all of that rubbish or is all of it correct? With some kind of mistake. That's the decision that they have to make. So they have to rely upon what? They have to rely upon how the Lord has led them in the past to know whether that is correct. Are these, well, I'll call it, I said it yesterday, these foundational principles and rules that have led them for 46 years, are these true or false? Do they throw everything away? And if they had, what did they do then? If you throw it all away in April, where are you left? Darkness. Sorry? Darkness. You're left in darkness. There is nothing there for you. You can't go and redo 46 years of history or methodology. It's just not, you're not able to do that. There's, there's too much weight of evidence. So the point of decision is they need to decide whether or not everything that they've taught is correct or not. They begin the review process and the people who do the review process, what conclusion do they come to? In the, with respect to the conclusions that they've made. Any mistakes? So any mistakes? No mistakes. Everything is correct. So they know all the methodology is right. So if the methodology is all correct, where do you have to target your, your investigation? Where do you have to go to to target your investigation to find out what's gone wrong? If all the methodology is correct. So if you check the history, they're not checking what's to take place. They know what's to take place. It's absolutely clear, Christ is about to come back to destroy the world. They know that, they know the sanctuary is the earth. They have to know the beginning. Sorry? Beginning. The beginning. That's where they're going to go and see there's a problem in the beginning. We have to understand about this on or before or about. That's where the problem is. I don't know if we know if you've studied or researched this. So after this, how did they, I don't know how they deal with 508. 508 is a bit problematic. So we'll put 508 to one side. It's there in the background hovering, but they're not really going to do much with it. And they're not going to do much with the 2520. So they leave both of those two prophecies aside and they're going to focus on the 2300 days. And when they focus on the 2300 days, which Bible passage are they going to go to, Sister Joy? They're going to go to Ezra 7. And Ezra 7 is going to be used to unlock or to work out their mistake. They don't use Ezra 7 like we do. Just want to understand that. And when Sister Joy says Ezra 7, and she said verse 9, you're not going to get the answer in Ezra 7 verse 9. Are you? Or are you? Are you going to get the answer in Ezra 7 verse 9, Brother Paul? Sorry? <coughs> are you going to get the answer in Ezra 7 verse 9? No? 
Why no? I know the funny reason. <laughs> okay. They've checked all the methodology. Everything is correct. So why have they made a mistake? They don't go and say it's a geographical problem. The sanctuary is wrong. They never do that. What did they do? They go and check the beginning of their prophecy. 457. They put 508 aside. They put 677 aside. They go to 457. So how are they going to work out the 457 beginning? Where do they go to? What passage? Sister Joy said they go to Ezra 7, 9. Do you agree with that? Okay. So they go to Ezra 7, 9. And are they going to find the answer to their problem in the verse? Sorry? Not... You said not? Yeah. Not what? So I'm saying that they are the beginning of the age. I'm just trying to get the word that you said. Okay. Directly. Yeah. So they're going to find it in Ezra 7, but not directly. They have to start using what? Don't proof text, they use what? Logic. They use logic to jump. To, through certain steps and they're going to end up getting to where? 10th day of the 7th month can't find the 10th day in the 7th month in that verse so they're going to use some logic to say this, this and this and we'll get to the 10th day of the 7th month must be that and then we're going to do that it's not that straightforward, but it's pretty much that's what they do. So they're going to get this prophecy and they're going to shift it six months from the spring to the autumn at the beginning. So they're going to shift the end from the spring to the autumn. And now they've got the autonomous feast they're going to be fulfilled. Uh, the Day of Atonement. And then <coughs> that's how they're going to go from the spring to the summer. Use the Sorry? I'm saying we don't use the so no. We don't use it. Oh, um, Sister Joy, what logic did they use? Sure. You're not sure? Brother Robert, you've been quiet. What logic did they use? So we go to the types. You go to the 23 and this talks about the cleansing of the sanctuary at the end of at the end of the time prophecy. So you have to go back to the beginning of the time prophecy and look. The logic is if the end is the cleansing of the sanctuary, the beginning must be the cleansing of the sanctuary. So in 457, you must now begin to look at when the sanctuary was cleansed and the sanctuary was cleansed on the day of atonement, the tenth day of the seventh. So they're going to use a number of different pieces of logic to establish that it's going to be 10th day of the 7th month. Their, their first port of call is Ezra 7. So we'll just go with the Ezra 7 bit. What is Ezra 7 going to teach them? He's not going to teach them 10th day of the 7th month. What is it going to teach them, Brother Paul? So, good teacher, there was a young that we from the part of the first month from Babu to Jerusalem. And then I arrived in Jerusalem in the first day of the fifth month. So, just, so that's the word, explain the logic. What's it, what, what, conceptually, what's it, show, what's it telling them? My brother? I think there's a seven nines uh in the two days at the beginning, uh, when they leave Babylon and when they arrive in Jerusalem. But when the degree arrive in Jerusalem, they are now going to make uh, mobilization. Degree, Don't tell us what we believe. Yeah. You're telling us what we believe. I want you to tell us what the Millerites are thinking. They don't they don't they're not that sophisticated. Just tell me the logic why Ezra 7 shows you it can't be spring. 
That's where they begin. Uh, the logic that Simmons now was having is that the terminal fees are not yet uh, fulfilled. No, that's, that's not Ezra 7. That's another logic. Then I turn up your mind. I think the temple logic they are using after now, uh, seeing that they just, they just took place on the first day of the first one with this spring, that only was that uh, the beginning of the year will take place uh, at the beginning of the journey. Take some, some time. What can't happen? The beginning of uh, the year. I don't know. <coughs> yeah. Why can't it happen? Okay, so the logic they're going to use is they're just leaving from Babylon and they haven't got to the end of their journey so they don't want to use the spring so that's one logic the other logic that they're going to use is the feasts and the third piece of logic they're going to use Someone said? 70 weeks. So it's the history of Christ. So it's the it's the history of Christ plus the autonomous feasts plus Ezra 7. So at a simple level, they're just leaving their journey at the spring, at the beginning of the year. They haven't got to Jerusalem yet. So something has to happen in Jerusalem. So they know it's not going to be there. They have to get to the end of their journey where all of this thing is going to come to its completion then the autonomous feasts everybody okay with the autonomous feasts? no? brother Andrew you okay with the autonomous feasts? explain that brother Wilson before I say that the thing was that the feedings that Father we were studying you say that milk have been for sale about on or before. And so the study, you say, milk have been for sale maybe 457, 458 or 456. <coughs> so another thing I think they went to, because the Bible was going to tell us the seventh year of the king of Artemisoxis. So even before they arrived, which is the seventh year, they went to Bath for certain. What was the first year of King Artemis? So that they may ascertain what was the seventh year when the decree was given. Okay. Um, autonomous feasts. Brother Robert? So they realized that the, the feasts are divided into two. Some happen during the spring, others happen during the autumn. And they, they look at the spring feasts, they realize that all the spring feasts were fulfilled to the date and to the event, to the time and to the event during the first advent of Christ. So therefore, the logic is that the autumn feasts are going to be fulfilled to the very later, specifically the dates and the events are the second coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ to them is what is happening in the future. So they're going to use Ezra 7 to know that it can't be in the spring. They're going to use another logic to say that the first advent was fulfilled in the spring feast and the second advent will be fulfilled um, through the types of the autonomous feasts. How many feasts are there? So we've got seven feasts split into four and three. Brother Andrew, list how many you can you know, and tell me which where I put them. We've got seven feasts, four and three, four in the spring, three in the autumn. I am also familiar with that with the season. No. Okay, so you just tell us which feast you know. Sorry? The feast of unleavened bread. Is that in the spring or in the autumn? Or you're not you're not sure? Okay. 
So bread. <coughs> Can I hear? Tabernacle, do you know where that is? That's fine. My brother? Sorry? I just didn't hear what you said. Talking Feast of Shelter. Yeah. So that's Tabernacles. Yeah. I'll give you help. <laughs> Daniel eight fourteen. Yeah, the Atonement. Day of Atonement. Yeah. In the spring or the autumn? Autumn. My brother? Let me have one. Oh, oh yeah. Feast of the trumpet. Feast of trumpets? Feast of the first wheat. First wheat? Fruit. First fruit. First fruit. First fruits. <coughs> yeah. Weeps. Sorry. Weeps you. The way sheaf yeah. is that first fruit. Sister Jackie? Awesome. Sister Emma? Awesome. If they're all correct, we're missing one. If they're all correct. I've got trumpet, atonement, tabernacles, first fruit, unleavened bread, Passover. Pentecost. Do we agree with all of those? Yes. Yeah? They're all correct? Yes. So Passover, bread, uh, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, tabernacle. Yeah? Yes. So the Millerite logic is this is the first advent, this is the second advent. All that okay, brother Andrew? First Advent, Passover, what is that? First Advent, Jesus' first Advent, the Passover, what is the fulfillment of Passover? Passover is the literal, so it's a parable. What's the spiritual? Okay, Brother Wilson. Sorry? The cross. The cross. So that's the cross. <coughs> and leaving bread, Brother Rogers? It's rest in the tomb of Sabbath. So you want to put rest, that's unleavened bread. First fruit. Resurrection. Do you agree with Brady's rest? Uh, Pentecost, my brother? Uh, Pentecost. Pentecost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll call it former rain. <laughs> no, I won't call it former rain. Uh, we'll call it latter rain. Because you said outpouring. Uh, trumpets. Uh, 
Maybe this one's not so easy. Trumpet. So one person's telling me October 13th and another person's telling me 1833. Um, atonement. That's easy. Sorry? Ten day, Ten day the seventh month. So uh, I'm going to put October 22nd. Yeah? And tabernacles. Tabernacles? It's a feast shall be celebrated. I can't hear? It's a feast that shall be celebrated in heaven. So you watch that for in heaven? The thousand years? Prove that? Yeah. Yeah? Everybody agree with that? Tabernacles? You don't agree with that? Okay, so uh, some people say it's seven days, and some people say it's. Uh, I put the thousand years because if I use millennium, some it, it kind of looks. It's using the millennium like saying Trinity. Is that like a dirty word to say the millennium? I don't know about that. So, any other th tabernacles, Sister Emma? What's tabernacles? <coughs> Sorry? Do you see which one you go before? In Gandhi. So it's a thousand years then you're saying? A thousand years. <laughs> I thought you came to the movement on the sanctuary model. <laughs> They're like wishy washy on that. Those Australians are wishy washy people. <laughs> so, Australians don't give a firm understanding of the tabernacle. It's a public record now. Sorry, what's that mean? <laughs> you lost me now. Jub Where's Jubilee here? <laughs> no, I'm trying to tabernacle. Tabernacle. Jubilee is Jubilee. <laughs> yeah, but if you tell me Jubilee, I'm going to ask what Jubilee means. <laughs> I can't do that, then. <laughs> I can't do Jubilee if you're not going to tell me what that means. Anyone else? Brother Kephas, you said you're back, you weren't sure about the the autonomous feasts or types. No, I don't know. Answered all your, you sure? Sorry. You sure? It answered it? No. It answered your question? You said you're sure, you're happy now? No, I understand. I'm, I'm just making sure that you do you don't have any questions. I understand that. But? <coughs> <laughs> you got a question or you don't know what your question is? My question is an answer. You're sure? The reason, I'm, the reason I'm, I'm asking is because most Adventists know these seven feasts, but we don't really have a clear understanding, especially these ones, of actually how they operate and how they work. The Tabernacles was one as an example. We're not unsure. And by the way, the Millerites aren't sure about Tabernacles either. You know, hard up onto um, October 13th. So this is, you may or may not know this. October 13th, Miller is going to say, everything's going to finish when? He's accepted Snow's message. He's going to say, everything's going to finish when? He's going to say in ten. 10 days or 
15 days. Or 15 days. Why would you say 15 days? So if Christ will not come on 10 days, A is a 15. <laughs> Why 15? Because the tabernacles. So he's going to say, I'm still not sure, and we're, I've been preaching for 46 years, I'm still not sure whether it's the Day of Atonement or tabernacles that he's going to come. So it, it, it's not that straightforward. Um, and the Millerites certainly aren't clear. Miller isn't certainly clear. Hard up onto the 13th of October. Um, any quick questions? Okay, so I, I left that one there because we'll, 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 I won't do that now. Okay, the, the feast of unleavened bread. What's that word? Rest. 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 They said uh, Jesus rested in the tomb. That was the feast of unleavened bread. Did you just accept that? You just like you just nodded like. No, he hasn't accepted that. So we're going to look at that because I didn't know what they were talking about either. But I didn't want to look ignorant, so I just said that looks good. But that you've mentioned it, we'll have a look at it. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll do that. Any quick points? So you say when they come to April, they want to look at 677. But if you look at Snow's document, 677 as one of his weaknesses. Oh, he does? Yeah. Okay, so we'll add that in. I missed that. So we've got um, the autumn. We've got 677. We've got Ezra. And what else did we say? Oh, and Christ's uh, week. Sorry? The 6,000 years. Let's pray. Oh. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks for your goodness. Lord, as we have experienced this morning the rising of the the sun, we ask, Lord, that the day star might arise in our hearts. It's a beautiful experience uh, to see nature explaining to us and unfolding to us the mysteries of your word. May each of us receive the blessing as we feel the warm rays touching us and encouraging us. May we be encouraged by the truth that we're learning here. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.